Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for showing up. Um, so I'm uh, an economist, uh, game theorist, and um, also been interested in information communications technology for quite a while. And so uh, I agree with Guido that, that uh, including economics and game theory and incentives and so forth and distributed systems and other things is very important. But I have to say on the other side, economists are not so good at understanding the computer science. And not only computer science, there's other things you've got to bring in like law and, uh, and accounting and uh, regulation. I mean, blockchain is actually a really all-inclusive thing and you fail anywhere and the system doesn't work. So anyway, this is a, uh, an examination of distributed systems. And um, let's just start with talking about uh, consensus mechanisms and what they're supposed to do. Uh, so consensus mechanisms really have two fundamental jobs. Um, we're trying to establish a canonical version of a, uh, of a data set, uh, something that we you know, can all agree and understand that that's, uh, that's what the state of the world is. Uh, we're also uh, trying to assure that that canonical version is a correct version. Uh, it follows the rules, it, it does things that we want it to do. It'd also be great if it had other properties, you see listed there, uh, but uh, unfortunately we have a number of impossibility theorems in computer science. So one of the most fundamental is the CAP theorem, and what this tells us is that if you have a distributed data store, uh, you can't simultaneously satisfy three basic desirable conditions. One is consistency, uh, availability, and partition resistance. So you can't have a data system in which you can have all of the, all of the nodes available and have consistency amongst all the nodes uh, if, you are will, if you want to tolerate the possibility of partitioning. And so if you had all three, it'd be great because then you would have an honest canonical ledger and then we could all go home and have a beer and everything would be wonderful. Uh, the other fundamental theorem is the FLP theorem. And what this says is that if you have an asynchronous uh, system, uh, you can't have uh, termination and safety. Uh, you can't guarantee that you'll get those uh, in finite time if you have a, possible, a possibility of at least one failed process. So safety is something you certainly want because, at least it would seem so, uh, because if components decide on different values, then you don't, it's not clear how you'd get a canonical ledger. You don't really know what the, what the truth is going to be. Termination, of course, is important because otherwise you never decide about anything. Uh, there's also uh, another result that sort of works its way into all of these consensus mechanisms. That's, that's the idea of Byzantine fault tolerance. And you know the story, I'm sure, of the Byzantine general lamp reports work and so forth. Uh, but Byzantine fault tolerance uh, is really something coming from computer science. Uh, oops, did I skip a slide? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, uh, that talks about how much of the system has to be honest, how much of it has to function correctly uh, to achieve, uh, to achieve uh, the outcomes that you want. And so if you have proof of work, um, the way that you determine what's canonical is you look for the longest chain. So the longest chain is the one that has the authority in the system. Uh, you get uh, immutability, or at least uh, practical immutability, through recursive hashing of the, of the blocks. And this just makes uh, rewrites detectable and very expensive. Uh, honesty, correctness, that's really just decide, uh, decided by the longest chain, which means that at least 50% of the hashing power has to behave according to protocol. If not, you'd have no guarantee that you have a correct, uh, a correct uh, version of, of, the, uh, of the ledger. Proof of stake, on the other hand, uh, gets canonicalness by having two-thirds weighted voting majority in many, many different ways uh, to decide which blocks are correct and how that updates the ledger. They also use recursive hashing to make uh, at least detectable if you have altered the data. Uh, and honesty is uh, uh, obtainable if you have uh, fewer than one-third dishonest nodes. All right, so let's think about how good a model Byzantine fault tolerance is for actual real-world security. So there are three or four mining pools, uh, we all know this, uh, that have the majority of, of Bitcoin's hashing power. 
Uh, and if you ignore that fact, estimates are that it would cost something like a billion to three billion dollars for a bad actor to acquire enough computational resources to have a 51% attack. It would be even cheaper to rent those resources. Um, proof of stake uh, is even cheaper. Smaller chains like Ethereum are even cheaper. Uh, so it really is not that, there's not that much of an economic barrier, in fact, to at least temporarily uh, gain control of a chain and then corrupt that chain. And so why has this not happened? <clears throat> well, it has happened, right? We have seen 51% attacks against smaller chains. And I think the reason it probably hasn't happened in the case of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin contains Bitcoin. Bitcoin is awesome, you know, I'd like a lot of Bitcoin. It's, what is it, 140 billion? I don't know what it is today. That's real money, but it's not real, real money. Suppose that you were to take, say, the New York Stock Exchange and tokenize it and put it on the Bitcoin chain or the Ethereum chain is more likely. Now you've got trillions of dollars of economic value on a blockchain and you can attack it, cause an economic attack, chaos, for a billion dollars, three billion dollars. Um, or if you're China or Russia, <coughs> you've already got the machines. You just turn them on and take over the Ethereum blockchain because you've got plenty of hashing power. You crash New York Stock Exchange. Even if you can't actually retain the stock certificates that you've, that you've stolen, because there's eventually a reorg, for two weeks no one can trade. All right, so this is an economic attack that's worthwhile, even if you don't actually steal things. So in other words, you want to think about the, the metagame. What are the incentives that go beyond directly what you can steal on-chain? There are things that might exist outside. So who would do these kinds of attacks? Well, you could even imagine the NSA doing one because Bitcoin funds terrorists or drug, uh, drug dealers or it's uh, per se illegal because you don't report your income. So there could be perfectly you know, legitimate, quote unquote, reasons that the NSA would decide to take down Bitcoin. It's just illegal, so we have to destroy it, of course. Uh, China, uh, Russia, cyber attacks, North Korea, who knows what they do, and Canada, well. All right. So what is it that you actually want? So I'd like to propose a new paradigm. I'd say we have the CAP theorem, we've got FLP, we've got Byzantine fault tolerance. So these are like a parent telling you what you can't do. You know, you'll never succeed. You'll never be a football player. Okay. What can we do? You know, what is it that we can actually achieve within distributed systems? And so what I'd like to propose is a different thing that we should try to achieve and show that I think it is possible. So the first thing is instead of, uh, is accessibility. <coughs> so accessibility is different from availability because all it says is that there exists a current correct copy of the ledger upon which any non-partitioned user can transact. Okay, that doesn't say that every node has a copy of the ledger and every node is available. All it says is that there exists at least one that I can access. Well, why do I need more than one? You know, so if you have replicated data but I can find one correct copy, that should be enough. Right? So the goal of having every single node online and telling me what it is, uh, the same data, is actually overkill per se. We have to get more than just being able to find a copy, and that's the rest of it. So the second thing we need is provable honesty. So if I see a version of the ledger, so I, can, I have the availability of a ledger version, I should be able to prove to myself that that ledger is correct. All right, well, every well-defined well, uh, well blockchain has that property. Right? It's a state transition machine, so it's deterministic. You have the same set of inputs, you get the same set of outputs. So there really should be only one truth. All right? You can not design them well, but every well-designed blockchain has the property that if you have access to the ledger and access to the supporting transactions, you can prove that all the protocols were followed or prove that they weren't. <clears throat> okay, so um, the problem is obviously that you can have separate forks that are correct. If separate forks, maybe in a partition, have looked at different transactions, they could have correctly validated those transactions and updated the ledger, but we now have two mutually inconsistent ledgers, right? So they're correct, but they're not consistent. So the last thing we need is provable canonicalness. 
Okay, so what this says is that users with access to a ledger and its supporting transactions can prove whether it is canonical in the sense that it is authoritative and no other version of the ledger and supporting transactions will ever supersede its authority. So if that's what I have, if I have those things, if I can actually look at the data that's internal to a specific ledger and determine that on the basis of that information, it is canonical, that nothing will ever supersede it, and I know that it's honest, and I can see it, I have access to it, what else do I want? That's enough, right? All right, well, let's think about this in the context of proof of work and proof of stake. Well, proof of work ledgers by construction can never be canonical, uh, we, or they cannot be provably canonical. And the reason is that if we see a ledger, we know its length. We, we see a chain, a fork, we know its length. Uh, but we don't have any idea about the dog that didn't bark. There could be a, a longer chain out there that we've never seen. Somebody could be hiding blocks. Uh, somebody could, the NSA could have spun up a million servers and they could be riding a longest chain that will eventually orphan the chain that we happen to see publicly. Uh, this could happen later, it could be happening now. China could shut the Great Wall and uh, build a chain there that nobody can see and that might be longer or shorter than the chain that lives outside of China. So what do you do? So by construction, the longest chain is a definition that, uh, uh, that is externally referential. It's always relative to something else and that something else therefore cannot live on the chain that I'm inspecting. So I can never actually determine uh, canonicalness. Proof of stake has the same problem. Uh, the problem with, uh, whoops, low battery. <laughs> okay, the problem with uh, proof of stake is that it's possible to double sign. So if I have uh, people that are, that are supposed to validate the transactions and sign the blocks, um, there's no way to tell if they've only signed one block at a specific height, right? I can look at a chain, I can see here in this fork, they have signed the block, we've got the correct two-thirds majority of, of voters on this block, but there could be another block that also has a two-thirds majority. So again, uh, the evidence in that particular chain that I have access to doesn't prove to me that they're not double signed chains someplace else. All right, so I cannot prove canonicalness from the data within the chain. Okay, so then the proposal is that the design objective uh, should be to have a blockchain protocol that satisfies accessibility, provable honesty, and provable canonicalness. All right, so what this means is that every non-partitioned user can transact on a ledger that they know is correct and will never be superseded by another ledger. And I claim that's all you really need from a distributed uh, ledger. Um, note that this is not uh, precluded by FLP and the CAP theorem, right? Because we're not requiring uh, um, uh, 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 availability, right? So we're not requiring safety. It's fine if people lie, right? What's important is I can identify it as a lie, right? You can tell me fake news, but if I can identify it as fake news, who cares, right? If you tell me the truth and I can identify that, and I have access to the truth, I can have lots of people saying fake things, but if I, know, if I can identify the truth and have access to the truth, the fake news doesn't make any difference. I simply ignore it, okay? So that's the fundamental idea. Okay, so honesty and canonicalness are logically different things. And this is something that's really important in blockchain here. Because a ledger supported by a longest chain or uh, endorsed by two-thirds of the voters could simply be a pack of lies. Right? We could have the longest chain not follow protocol. Or the, we could have, we could have uh, uh, two-thirds of the voters ignore the fact that transactions are not properly signed. Right? This is a possible thing. Now you might object. You might say that uh, if a ledger, if, if, a, if, a, if a fork is provably dishonest, if it doesn't follow pro protocol, uh, it is per se invalid. So a longest chain that's incorrect is really not the longest correct chain and therefore it's irrelevant. So that might be nice to say, but it doesn't help users because users see this longest chain, they see a chain that has all the proper votes, and 
what do they do? They say, oh, my goodness, there's, a, there's an error here. There's, there's something that's wrong. Do they simply walk away? You know, what are their, what are their options? In fact, there's, there's really very little within the protocols that tell us what to do if the users can prove that the majority, that the, the, the voting majority, has done something that they absolutely know is incorrect. So if the two-thirds majority says blue is orange, well, what do you do? It's obviously not, but, but what it, you, you, there's really not much within protocol that you can, you can do to fix it. Okay, so, um, and we've seen this. It's not just a theoretical problem. Uh, there are errors in Bitcoin that go way back to the beginning. There are minor errors. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, Ethereum didn't follow protocol. They, they, uh, they had a hard fork. Uh, so we do see the cases where protocol is not followed, where the, the chain is provably dishonest, and yet we say, ah, it's all right. You get a mulligan. Let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so here's a, here's a case going forward. We're about to have the happening, right? So we have the happening in Bitcoin. What if the node said, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, screw that nonsense. We're not going to have. We're just going to continue to get the same rewards we used to get. Let's all agree, guys. So we just go ahead and keep on writing our, our block rewards to the same level. Now, users look at this and say, wait, you should have cut your block rewards in half. All the nodes decide they're not going to. What are users going to do? Say, all right, that's it. I'm done with Bitcoin. Maybe we even think it's fair. Maybe we think the happening is a bad idea. So this might be a misdemeanor violation of protocol or a protocol violation we can accept. So if you can do that, what can't you do? Right, so where do you draw the line there? So that's the problem with, with, uh, with uh, canonicalness there. All right, the other question is, why are we thinking about Byzantine fault tolerance as the basic security model? So. Byzantine fault tolerance really comes from computer science, obviously. And I think it has in mind the notion that you have components that operate correctly or incorrectly. So these are components that don't really have preferences. They don't really have objectives. They simply do or don't do what you expect them to do. Now, people are different than that, obviously. Uh, you ask me if I'm honest. Well, I'm an economist, so obviously I'm not. Uh, but Really, some days I am, some days I'm not. I'm not, you know, make me an offer. What's it worth? You know, I have a price. All right, and so most people are like this. So dishonest is not broken. Dishonest is human. Dishonest is maybe even predictable, right? So uh, this idea that we have this abstract notion of honest nodes and dishonest nodes, broken nodes and, and correct nodes is really not true. All the nodes are run by humans. None of the humans are broken in this sense, but some of them don't follow protocol because it's optimal. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the notion of honesty and correctness and leave the harder questions of uh, canonicalness and accessibility. All right, so if you've been at talks like this before, you're saying, oh my god, another economist saying we need a gain theoretic guarantee of security. It's old, right? It's been said many, many times. All right, so actually, I would say economists haven't done an especially good job in the space. Uh, game theory in particular uh, hasn't really been used in a way that I think is, is, uh, is convincing in this space. Um, and that's because I think the design goals of mechanism uh, e economists are really not strong enough. It, the, the ambition is too weak. Yes? So, as you were laying out your goals, the one that seemed impossible given your other goals was canonical. Yeah, that's a hard one. So, can you, can you say enough about it to establish why we should believe that it's possible within the context of your other goals? I can't do it in 11 minutes. Okay, I will, I'll talk to you afterwards, though, but you're right. You're actually, that's exactly the way to, the thing to call me on. So the, the short answer is that there are, there, so as a theorist, what I would say is this. It's not impossible, right? So now we have to establish constructively that it is possible, in fact, right? So that's a different issue, but it's not impossible because it doesn't violate the theorems. Is it possible, uh, what, what actually we can do is we can give you a, uh, a probabilistic eventual guarantee that you will find canonicalness. And that happens with other elements of the, the protocol, which I can't talk about in 10 minutes. But that's, that's the hard question. <laughs> okay, so 
we're, too, we're not ambitious enough. The, what, what, what game theory is doing in this space is not ambitious enough, and, I, and here are the reasons. So you probably have heard the word incentive compatible used in various contexts. So what incentive compatibility means is that we can achieve a desired outcome when each agent acts in his own self-interest. And there's some technical details, and I'll omit them for now. But that's very, very weak. Um, so as an example, um, uh, honest validation and following protocol rules is in fact a Nash equilibrium of both proof of work and proof of stake systems. So it is incentive compatible. Being honest is incentive compatible. But the fatal flaw in this is that in most systems, most real systems, most mechanisms, and in, certainly in most consensus mechanisms, there are also many other equilibrium. So there are many other Nash equilibrium. And there's no particular reason to believe that you're at your favorite Nash equilibrium. All right? They're all equally likely. There's a question of equilibrium selection. You may do things that push you one way or the other, but there's no reason to believe that any Nash equilibrium is privileged above any other Nash equilibrium. And an example would be, you get the sort of, uh, you know, real. Uh, some countries drive in the right, some countries drive in the left, both are Nash equilibrium. And in fact, driving in the middle or driving any place is also a Nash equilibrium because if everybody else does, what can I do to improve myself, right? So they're all of those Nash equilibrium. And well, we, we might coordinate and then we might you know, do better. In the case of blockchain, what if I gave you the example of the happening? So what if all of the nodes simply decided they were not going to cut their, their rewards in half? Would I, as a node, decide I'm going to reject all the blocks that come my way that, that don't half my reward? Well, first of all, you know, I get a higher reward. Secondly, I never add a block because everybody else is only sending me blocks that have that property. So I cut my throat two ways if I refuse to go along with that, with that outcome. So that's another Nash equilibrium, and there are an infinity of them. All right, so Nash is just far too weak. Um, Dominus, so the reason Nash is too weak is because it's only proof against unilateral deviation. It's not proof against deviation by larger coalitions. Dominant strategy is, would seem to be better because dominant strategy says no matter what anybody else does, I should do a thing. That's a dominant strategy, right? So that sounds very strong, but it's not because as a coalition, we might do better. The classic example is the prisoner's dilemma. A dominant strategy is to confess, but as a group, we cannot confess and do better than we would following dominant strategies. So dominant strategy, no good. So if we believe that coordination is possible, we have to have more than proof against unilateral deviation. And do you believe it's true in blockchain? Well, mining pool, sibling, coalition among large stakeholders, uh, concentration of wealth. So clearly, collusion is, is possible and, and happening all the time in blockchain. Okay, so what do we need from game theory? So we need a mechanism that has two properties. One, that honest following of protocol is the only equilibrium. So it's unique. There is only one equilibrium. We also need that equilibrium to be coalition-proof, okay? So coalition-proof equilibrium says that just simply extends the notion of, uh, of uh, proof against unilateral deviation to say that there does not exist a coalition, one agent, five agents, the entire coalition, the grand coalition, that can follow any strategy besides honesty that improves their welfare. So there is no coalitional deviation even by one agent or the grand coalition that improves uh, the welfare of the agents above following protocol. So that's dominant, that's coalition proof equilibrium. And formally in economics we'd say that we want to implement honesty in coalition proof equilibrium. Implement means unique and uh, coalition proof we've just talked about. Okay, so let me give you an example. Here's a possibility. Okay, so here's a constructive idea of how we might do that in blockchain. So I'm gonna, it's not about blockchain because it's easier to do it in this context. So let's think about a unanimity game. And here's how it works. I ask you all, I say, pay me a dollar and you can play my game. In the room next door, there's a name written on the blackboard. Uh, you go ahead and tell me whatever you think that name happens to be, write it on a piece of paper, throw it here on the stage, I'll go through all the papers and if 
it all says the same thing. I Bob happens to be the name. If Bob is the name that everybody writes, you each get $2, we go home, we have a beer. If anybody disagrees, then nobody gets anything, all right, and you lose a dollar. Okay, so that's the unanimity game. Well, there are many equilibrium here, right? One is we all write Bob. Another is we all write Guido. We, we get paid, right? It's not the correct answer, but we all get paid. One is I write Bob, you write Guido, you write John, and then it doesn't matter what you do, right? If you guys, no matter what you write, you're not going to generate unanimity. So you may as well write Fred and Frida and whatever you feel like. So discoordination is an equilibrium. Incorrect coordination is an equilibrium. Truthful coordination is an equilibrium. So many equilibrium. So we're not there yet. So let's add an auditing dimension. And this makes sense in the context of blockchain because the chain is public. We can see the data. So in fact, audits are really what blockchain is constructed for. So here's the audit dimension. The audit dimension is that uh, we play the same game and we add the, the, uh, the feature that all agents have to sign the paper that they, that they uh, throw down on the floor so I know who's making the claim. If they all agree, then fine. They might have written Guido when in fact the name is Bob, right? But uh, if they all agree, then that's fine. And we're going to add something else. We want to create an incentive to, make, to, to have people lie. In the other game, there was no reason to lie. But let's make it give an incentive here where if uh, whoever's name is written down unanimously on the paper gets a transfer of $1,000. So we'd actually like to construct a lie. So if we write John, I get the $1,000 and I divide it up amongst you to pay you for writing John instead of Bob, right? Okay, so the game works like this. You go ahead, you write down the name, you sign it, you throw it in the middle. If they all agree, I, whoever gets, whoever's name is written unanimously gets $1,000 and we go home. If there's one disagreement though, I go to the room and I open the door and I say, aha, it wasn't John, it was Bob, right? So anybody who wrote down the correct name gets to divide a bonus of $1,000. Anybody who wrote the incorrect name gets zero, goes home losing a dollar, right? All right, so the audit happens as soon as somebody has a disagreement, right? As soon as there's a lack of unanimity, I do an audit and I reward anybody who is, who is uh, who has uh, actually written the correct name in the event of an audit with an equal division of $1,000. Okay, so it's a very simple audit game. And what does this do for us? Well, it implements truth-telling in coalition proof equilibrium. And here's the way to understand that. Um, suppose that we try to get the grand coalition together and I say, look guys, everybody write down John, I'll get the $1,000, I'll divide it up. Well, Guido, no, he's an honest guy. Doesn't really matter, he's self-interested. So if he happens to write down Bob and all the rest of us write down John, Guido gets $1,000 and we lose a dollar, right? So I know that one of you guys is gonna break because it's, it's actually in the interest of every single individual and every single coalition to go ahead and say the truth if anybody else lies, right? Because I get to divide $1,000 amongst whatever group is telling the truth. On the other hand, if we all get together and lie, we get one nth of $1,000, right? So we can never pay more for the lie than we can incentivize to have people tell the truth. And what that means is that no coalition would ever attempt to get together to support a lie uh, because it would, we know that there would be defections in every case. And that also means we never actually have to run the audits and we never have to pay the $1,000 bonus as a bonus, right? Okay, so that's a simple way of understanding a mechanism. Okay, well, from there, uh, we need to show how this might adapt to blockchain. And so adapting to the blockchain would be to show that uh, any equal or unequal division of the tokens uh, 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 over the grand coalition is somehow blocked by a sufficient coalition of defecting agents telling the truth. So that's the first thing we have to do in the context of a mechanism a blockchain consensus mechanism. And then secondly, we have to answer the question of how the provability of dishonest in blockchain allows us to enforce proofs even when the majority is not claiming that something is false. Okay, so that's the second thing that we get out of blockchain. And the details about that uh, you can find in this technical paper there. Uh, paper there. Uh, this is a consensus, well, it's a 
It's a, uh, a validation protocol called Proof of Honesty. And uh, this is the basis of the, uh, the Geek uh, Project uh, uh, blockchain, which is blockchain as a service. And so, wow, 11 seconds. Awesome, I did it perfectly. So here's the conclusion. Uh, you can't always get what you want. Impossibility theorems tell us that we can't get these things on the top. But if you try hard, you can get what you need. What you need, I claim, is accessibility, provable honesty, and uh, provable canonicalness, and implementation of honest transaction validation and coalition proof equilibrium. So that should be the design goal. And thanks very much.